uh, wherever you have joined us from you are welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and we are so grateful to all our members our partners our friends that have joined us on this first day of Esther's fasting and we are going um, to learn a lot and we are also going to pray together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ let us pray and get right into today's session our father we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to come together like this from the north the south the east and the west and sit at the feet of jesus christ our lord and savior the master the king the prince the lord the owner and we give him all the glory father here we are seated today we are committing today's proceedings to you to the spirit of god and the word of god to build us up and to take us into the realities of such fasting and prayer as esther embarked on and the benefits that she realized that they may be manifested in our day and age even as you have done years ago and you have done even recently when we embarked on a journey like this and we give you the glory for it in the name of our lord jesus christ amen and amen can i hear you shout glory hallelujah praise the lord glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Um, such glory. I haven't heard them like this. Either it's because it's 2022 or it's because we are fasting, in which case we're going to have to fast a lot for me to hear you shout like this. It's the first time I hear you so many from your house you say glory 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 so fasting is doing you good glory to god amen so just some basic protocol so that you and i can uh, cooperate tonight you know uh, make sure that you keep your device muted if you do unmute to respond so i can hear you are still following you're still there because it's important that i carry you along so you can unmute and say amen glory and thank you always to evangelist Paul Matevis. He's faithful to do that always. And I know even his video um, is, is probably turned on as well. I truly appreciate that man of God. Anybody else who can join evangelist and also to let me know you are still there, you are responding to the message. I appreciate that so much. If you are able to turn on your video as well, so we know you are not sleeping and you just join and you are sleeping and you're not following us. That is also appreciated so so thankful for that man of god and everyone else who's gonna join you in that so thank you once again if you are joining us for the very very first time well this is our wednesday you know we normally have our bible study on this platform at half past six during this time our program is sitting at the feet of jesus christ you know that's the study of god's word every wednesday you have a link and then you join us and then you learn the word of god get your bible get your notebook the the spirit of god is advancing us the spirit of god is accelerating and upgrading us as we are sitting at the feet of our lord jesus christ we are not remaining the same we are getting better and better each and every day and not just better and better but you know better for for relevance in life you know whatever area we find ourselves in we are becoming better as a result of receiving the word of god and putting it into practice so we have embarked on esther's fasting uh, which is a church-wide uh, fasting and we are so grateful in the name of jesus christ for everyone that has actually joined us let me ascertain maybe uh, others have joined as church groups like uh coffee fountain i don't know it's, it's coffee fountain uh, in as a church group i want to greet you pastor martha and the team there in the free state we love you so much if i can hear you unmute and say glory 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 just coffee fountain i'm greeting you in the name of our lord jesus christ wow 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 
Wow, we are so grateful. That's like a free state glory. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm not sure if evangelists, uh, they've joined us uh, as a group, uh, Lamekas. If you can also unmute evangelists, I want to greet you and, and your people there in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Wow, wow, so very beautiful. Thank you, Evangelist, and the team down there in La Mecca's. Very special. Thank you uh, for that response. So let's get on into the Word of God and, uh, uh, and carry on so we can build our faith. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Build our faith. Build our faith. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So day one of Esther's fasting is... Uh, you know, to build our faith, we are uh, staying on uh, chapter 1 to chapter 3. You know, when you are fasting, obviously, uh, you fast under different circumstances. There are others that are fasting and they are at home. And there are others that are fasting, maybe they are at work and, and so forth. The Bible allows for such kind of fasting where... The Bible says, when you appear before men, when you are fasting, don't appear like, you know, one who's fasting, which means our Lord Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 6, there is fasting that you will embark on and you will be appearing before people, either for business, for work, for whatever purpose. Sometimes because you have interviews, you have a case, you have, you know, Jesus is giving us a secret there that there are certain things that when you are dealing with them and you have to appear before people, you have to be on a fast but let them not see that you are fasting but your father which is in heaven who sees in secret he will reward you openly which means whatever purpose you are fasting for for that appearance before the people you are going to be rewarded openly but the people will not know why you got such results <laughs> glory to god and it is the category of the fast that esther embarked on because it required that she goes and appear before the king and she appears before him when she was on a fast and the results of that is so tremendous and year in and year out as a church we have uh, chosen that kind of a fast and chosen to camp around the book of esther and glean every good thing that comes from the benefits of that kind of a fast and i am telling you that even this year we will be embarking on a journey that will bring so much revelation and it's going to be different from anything you have heard before you know if it's if it's anything that you have heard it's going to build upon you know uh, 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 the past but something fresh something good because the Spirit of God always um, is, is progressive revelation is progressive you know, you move from glory to glory, from faith to faith, you know, from one level to another level. That's what we need to understand. You can read the same verse, you know, so many times, but the levels of glory varies as you continue to do so. And we are so grateful for that. That's why we are still uh, zoning in in the book of Esther. And that's where we are at, saints. And we understand that this kind of a fast is the fast that is going to uh, help us when we have to appear before the people mm -hmm. and uh, take note of it because you may need to embark on it at a family level at a personal level whatever the case is that you are dealing with this is the fast jesus was referring to which says don't appear before men to fast don't don't show that you are actually fasting because he knows there will be moments that you will need to appear before the people but secretly you are fasting and the reward of it it's what you want to experience openly before those kind of people whether it's a case a court case whatever it is this kind of a fast works and we have so many testimonies of those that have embarked on it and they have come back with a testimony of what it has done and we are so grateful for it in the name of jesus christ amen so uh, at some point, you know, as we are sharing, it will lead into a prayer, prayer point. And at that point, I want all of us to pray. 
where you are, I want you to unmute and to begin to pray in the light of the Word of God as well as the light of that particular prayer point. And, uh, you know, the Bible says, watch and pray, watch and pray. So my expectation is, as you are praying, you know, you will actually uh, also be watching. So you, you see, when I do like this, I'm saying, in Jesus' name, amen. We are supposed to say amen. We mute all of us. We move on, and then we can get on to the next segment. That way, we can benefit a lot from this kind of session. It's interactive. I want you to pray with me. I want to pray with you as well. But at some point, we say Amen, and then we move on to the next. So I want you to be observant so that there is little to no uh, disruption to the flow. And once again, I'm asking you to check your device regularly so that you actually keep it muted, except when you are responding to the message, and then you can mute again. I will truly appreciate that, saints, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, so you don't disturb me. So... <clears throat> The book of Esther, chapter 1 to chapter 3. If I was to tell you just the background to this, um, um, this book, this book, you cannot understand it unless you understand the historical setting of, of the book itself and, and what was happening. But then, you know, with that historical setting, you also have to go back to the generations so far, so you can understand the origin of the battle that Esther, Mordecai, and the Jewish people, they found themselves in during this time in Persia. This will have happened, you know, just around 500 uh, BC, uh, you know, at the time of uh, the Persian Empire that had taken over from the Babylonian Empire as prophesied by the servant of God, the man of God, uh, Daniel, you see. But then you then need to understand that this is an epic ancient battle that Esther and Mordecai will find themselves in, that they are actually entering an ancient battle. And uh, it's very important because you have, uh, you have families, you have individuals that cannot explain the source of the battles they are in. Oh, how sad it is for you to suffer on the firing line and you don't even know why you are suffering. You know, you can suffer because of the battles from ages ago, from generations past. Battles that may have been entered into by your forefathers, you see. And this is exactly what was happening to Einstein Mordecai. Fortunately, uh, Mordecai was very quick uh, to understand the nature of the battle he, and, and that helped him to respond accordingly. He, he understood it. But you know, you have got families that suffer losses. They can lose so many individuals because of these ancient battles. You know, they are ancient battles that limit certain individuals, males or females in a family to a certain age. And they cannot explain why they die young. Nobody can even explain because it's actually an ancient battle. And it, it goes on like that. And then you've got certain families that uh, when certain individuals reach certain age, there are certain occurrences that they go through. Some of them, they can't even notice that at all. And as a result of that, they cannot even respond. And you will understand when it comes to Esther's fasting, it is a response to understanding the nature of the battle that you have encountered in your life. It's important, saints, to understand the battles that, that come your way. It is at that point that, you know, I'd like to encourage you that, you know, when you still have uh, elderly people in your family, uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, take them out, you know, take them out to a restaurant and take a notebook. You know, you're just going out to note down a family history that will also help you understand your roots, understand where you come from as a family, and also understand all these extended people that sometimes you call friends, but they're actually very close relatives, so that you don't marry, you know, uh, your close family as well. But also for you to know the nature of 
the battles, you know, where do they come from? You know, understand that because it's very, very important so that you can have the right response. This story of Esther and Mordecai, it's a story of an ancient battle that was started many years ago. And in fact, the battle itself started in the womb. And you think about it, you are talking about, you know, sometime around 1,500, 2,000 years uh, uh, before this. You know, they are coming in, it's 500 be before uh, Christ came, but the, the battle has been there for, for over 1,000, 1,500 years, and it's still there, you see. And they are encountering and experiencing it, but they may not know why they are actually going through this. And one of the things that you can pray, even during this Esther's fasting, it's a prayer that says, Lord, open my eyes, you know, to the nature of the battles that I find myself in. That's a prayer point. Open my eyes to the nature of the battles I find myself in. They are source. Where do they come from? Lead me into right information concerning the battles that I find myself in. Bring them to light. Bring to light all the necessary information. Bring to light. Bring to uh, bring it to to uh, to my knowledge. Glory to God. And, and and God can do that in many ways, my brother and sister. He can he can show it to you in a vision where by the Spirit of God He can take you into the past and then where you can be able to see where certain battles come from. I'll never forget what the Lord did for me about six years ago, seven years ago. You know, we were busy with uh, the, the project at church building and we have had to handle so many rocks. And uh, one of the rocks there really stood out for me. You know, the shape of that rock really, really stood out. It, uh, it caught my attention. We were actually digging it out of the ground and it caught my attention. And it took us very long to get that rock because uh, only a, um, a little portion of it was sticking out. But about 80 or 85 percent of it was buried, you know. So when you look at it on surface, it looks like it's a small rock, it's small exposure. And uh, we started to dig that rock. It took us very long. Some of the men here will remember that, but they don't know what happened uh, to me afterwards. Because then when I went home, uh, not long after that, then I get a revelation where I am actually seeing uh, that shape, the shape of that rock was actually, uh, uh, you know, in the form of, let's call it a God uh, that my forefathers worshipped. And, and when I was young, obviously, uh, you know, uh, they call it uh, offering uh, to the ancestors and uh, you will have your grandmother she will go to a corner there's a rock there and then she will take uh, she will take water and then she will talk and then she will uh, drink that water and uh, splash it out uh, into 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 that rock and pour certain things obviously that was done in ignorance but I remember one such incident that I have seen my forefathers do that uh, I have seen them do that once in, in that particular corner. But then this rock, when I saw it, the shape and so forth, it just caught my attention. I had no connection to what had happened when I was a young man. But the Spirit of God was able to use that as a point of contact. That's the reason why I had so much interest in that rock. You know, there are certain things that you are interested in. You have got questions about today because the Spirit of God wants to use them as a point of contact to bring a very, very important revelation concerning your life. And then, in that revelation, then I was able to be brought into understanding that when our forefathers were worshipping uh, th those rocks, they were actually uh, worshipping a God that was in the form of a baboon. And now, I also then understood because when I was young, very young uh, when I was sleeping and uh, I saw 
I, I saw this uh, this this baboon come, and it, it came in the in the moonlight. So it, there was a moonlight, and how do I know that? Because when that thing came in, or it was coming into where I was sleeping, which is in a rendezvous, the spirit of God took me up. I didn't know that's what the spirit of God did, but I, I was made to understand later on that the spirit of God. He, he picked me out and then I was above the roof of the house and I was able to see this baboon trying to go into the, the house where I was sleeping. And from outside, I was able to see that it was moon. There was a full moon and the light of that moon had lighted the family and the house and that's why I was able to identify that baboon. And that's one way you know that the vision is so real when it's 3D. When it's 3D, when a vision is 3D, where I mean you are even able to see the the form of, of that baboon in 3D. You understand? I hope you understand that. You you see the form of it. You know that vision is so real. And you're able to see the moon and so forth. So that that occurrence happened years ago. But the Spirit of God brought it to my attention. Uh, in the revelation or the vision that came later because of that interest that I had on that rock. Amazingly, then it started like a rock uh, in that shape and then it started to speak and it was the, it was the God. Um, uh, you know, not a G-O-D, big God Almighty, no. It was the gods that the people worship, you know. Different people worship gods of stones, gods of this and all sorts of things in ignorance but behind that is actually a spirit and that's what I was made to understand but this is what I'm saying and <laughs> I hope you are following so the Lord then revealed to me in that in that vision that he is actually uh, uh, setting me free this was an ancient thing and I was already born again and and and, uh, and the past and that's why I won't argue with people who say, well, if you are a Christian, you don't need deliverance. Well, it depends what you mean by that. If you think about man is a spirit, as a soul, he lives in the body. De deliverance can be in any part of this body. It can also be financial uh, deliverance, you know. We know that you can be the daughter of Abraham, the son of Abraham, and still be kept in bondage because the enemy is hiding through a spirit of infirmity for 18 years until Jesus shows up and he descended that by the gift of the, of the Holy Spirit and he removed that thing out. So Christian can be bound, if, if you were to ask me, I think a Christian can be bound in the area they are ignorant of. And that includes where they are ignorant of ancient battles. You know, there are certain things that happen even in your marriage because it's carried on from your forefathers. You don't know and the, the, because the fact that you cannot link it up with your forefathers you have got a wrong response to their marital problem and then what happened to your forefathers what happens to your parents it, it's repeated in your life so it's important to understand the nature of the, the battle that you are in the result of that freedom for me when the lord helped me and that thing was locked away glory to god <laughs> hallelujah it, it was locked away hallelujah Whew. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. You know, spirits can be locked away. Praise the Lord. We know in the book of Revelation, the Bible says uh, an angel went with a chain and then he, he bound uh, uh, the dragon, he bound Satan for a thousand years. He can be bound for years, my brother and sister. He can be bound. A spirit that troubled a family, a community, it can be arrested and bound. And uh, for many years, glory to God, for many years. And in that case, that thing was bound. The result of it, my brother and sister, was breakthrough upon all the family members and certain struggles that they had, the way was open. They don't know because that was revealed to me. You see, they don't know what happened. And, uh, 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 but you know, uh, as a child of God, that this breakthrough, look at it, it came after this. This thing has been stalled for a long time. This has been uh, uh, in blockage, in delay, stayed for a very, very long time. If there was one prayer point, my brother and sister, that I believe you and I 
we will have to pray tonight. It's going to be for God to bring to our attention the nature of the battles we find ourselves in. Whether it's, a, it's the battle you have in your business, in your career, in your marriage, or in your health, you know, in your health, there are certain things that are in your body and they were passed on. Let's understand how and uh, how did they come about so that we've got the right response. So if you go to the book of Esther, you're going to have to understand that this Esther and Mordecai, the whole story hinges around a man who has declared himself their enemy and the enemy of their nation. And he's called Haman the Agagite. Haman the Agagite. Now, you have to go and break down that Agagite, which is from Agag. And then you have to drill further down to understand who was Agag. Now, when you study the Word of God, um, you also have to be careful of certain people that are called by their titles instead of their personal name. For an example, the Pharaoh, it's not a name, it's a title of the king of Egypt. Abimelech is not the name of a king, it's the title of that leader or that ruler, you know, who ruled in that territory, you see, in Gerar. But if you are not careful, you will think, well, there was Abimelech in the day of Abraham, and then there was Abimelech in the day of Isaac, his son. And whereas you are dealing with different people, because it's a title. Most of the kings in the Bible is actually uh, a title more than their personal name. So Agag is a king of Amalek. So when you read, they say, um, this Haman is an Agagite. It means he's a descendant of that lineage of that king of Amalek. Now, if this is a king of Amalek, then the next question is, if this is a prince of Amalek, is a leader of Amalek, then you need to ask yourself, who's Amalek? Then Amalek will take you back to Eliphaz. Eliphaz, which means the god of gold. El, god of gold. Eliphaz. And this was the son of Esau. Esau, through Ada, gave birth to Eliphaz. And Eliphaz had children, got married, but then he had a concubine in Timna who gave birth to Amalek. So, which means Amalek is a relative of Jacob, of Israel, because Jacob and Esau are twins. And this is what I want to take you back to because when you read the book of Esther, you cannot explain the hatred that Haman had towards Mordecai and the Jewish people. First of all, if his source of problem is the disrespect from Mordecai, why go after the whole nation? Why go after the whole family? Because, you see, it's an ancient battle. It comes from far, my brother and sister. It's a terrible, it's a terrible a battle that comes from far. It's the enemy, you know. And then you have to go back to Esau and Jacob. And if you go back, you will see them too inside the womb of their mother, Rebecca. And as two, there was, they could not exist in a similar environment. You know, the, the environment in the womb is, uh, 
is the same. You have got what they call it amniotic fluids that gives the environment for for the babies. It's the same environment, but one of them could not live in that environment. That's why the mother was able to pick up that there seems to be a better, although she didn't know that she was actually carrying twins. Only to go to the Lord, which is the right thing to do. If God has blessed you and then you're having a problem with that blessing, go back to him, ask him why, so he can be able to give you an explanation. Otherwise, any other person's explanation will be a deception. They will deceive you. So she went to God, especially because she had waited for 20 years to have these children, you know. And now she has got the children. It's two manner of people. That's what the Lord says. There is two manner of people, two kinds of people, two, uh, two manner uh, 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 of, you know, nations, two nations in your womb. That's the reason why the other nation is comfortable. The other one is not comfortable. And, you know, it's a teaching for another day because it tells you there are certain things that do happen in the wombs once the children are, are there that could actually set them up for successful life or a failure when they are born here on earth. Because, you know, God then declares that he actually prefers uh, Jacob more than more than Esau. So where was Esau coming from? You know, what a question. Where was Esau coming from? But you see, that's where the battle started. You know, and when it started there, even the way they were born, the other one was holding the other one's heel. And when they came out, it was two kinds of people. The other one is the man of the field. The other one is the man of the tent. You see, one likes cold, the other likes warm. So we know who was fighting inside the womb. You know, uh, the womb, it's a warm place. So it was good for the men of the tent. Jacob, Esau, doesn't like it. It's too, it's too hot. He likes it out there where he's wearing animal skin. That's what he likes, cold environment. And inside the womb, he was not comfortable. So that environment was not comfortable for him. And that's why he came out first. He was a uh, <laughs> glory to God. He was in a hurry to get out of that environment. He was in a hurry. And Jacob was saying, hey, 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 I'm actually first, but you, you, you are going just because you don't like the environment, you know. That's why he came out and Jacob uh, had that knowing that, hey, I, I, I'm actually first. I need to, to get what belongs to me, the, the birthright, the first, the birthright. He understood that, Jacob. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But that's where the battle started, my brother and sister. And then we see that battle uh, surfacing throughout the scriptures. In the day when Israel came out of Egypt and they are going uh, to Canaan, their very first attack, you know, it's happening from Amalek in, in Genesis chapter 17. And that's the only battle that Moses led. It was the battle against Amalek. When Moses had to go to a mountain and, 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 and lift up his hands and have to be helped up by, by Aaron and her, you know, it's because Joshua and the team, they were fighting Amalek because Amalek attacked the weaker ones, the weaker ones, the wounded ones, the children, the women that were at the back. And these are millions of people coming and pro proceeding into the promised land. And they are not aware that at the back, the, the women that they've left there because they're carrying children and the others that are weak because they are tired and many other things and and and, and Amalek is, is killing them. And, and the report reaches Moses that hey, people are being reduced at the back. And, and who's doing that? It's Amalek. So if you were to say which one is an Amalekite spirit, it's a spirit that targets the weak. That's what it is. It wants to finish the ones that are already weak. If, if it finds itself in a family, in a business, if it finds itself in a church and it's allowed to operate, it, it will go after the weak ones and, and it will attack those. By the time you wake up, if you are sleeping, it has already done a lot of destruction. 
and that spirit is still here today. It, it does not have the name Amalek, but it assumes a, a, a different name uh, this day. And it can work through uh, internet and so forth, and then it's taking the weak ones, the weak ones, the ones that are feeble. Uh, the Bible says, uh, uh, strengthen, uh, uh, comfort the, the feeble-minded. Comfort the feeble-minded. And that verse is, is very important because it's telling you that if a person is a Christian, but they are feeble-minded, they are weak-minded, they can be taken advantage of, even if they are saved. They can be taken advantage of. And Amalek goes for such. He, he attacks the weak. If, if, if they are weak, when they are weak and, and their immune system is compromised, that's when Amalek attacks. Amalek is not strong, but he goes after the weak ones. That's what he does. So even here, you will see Haman is going after the Jewish because they, they are few in number. It's 500 in Shushan, the palace itself. It's 500, you know, including Esther and, and Mordecai. So it's a very little number. In, in that sense, they are little and they are weaker. But he goes after them because he goes after the weak. You know, whatever goes after the children, the, your children, uh, whatever goes after the weak ones in your house, you know, that's the spirit of Amalek. If, if, if you want to know where to start praying in the light of the book of Esther, is to pray that every spirit of Amalek that is operating in your house, in your community, in your family, in the name of our Lord Jesus, it be exposed. Because it goes after the weak, it operates in hiding. It's not open, it's in hiding. That spirit of Amalek, it operates against the weak and it's in hiding. That's why if you read uh, um, 1 Samuel chapter 30, just jot it down, you'll read it on your own time. You will see that the time when David had joined the Philistines because he was staying with Achish, you know, the, uh, uh, the king there, and, and he, he had, Achish was going with the lords of Philistines to go and fight uh, Saul, the king of Israel, with the Israelites. But because David had been on the run and was staying with the Philistines, he joined the, uh, you know, the armies of the, the Philistines. And he left his family. At that time, he had his two wives, you know, uh, Abigail, you know. And he, he left them there with the, the wives of his 400 men. And he left them in a town called Ziklag. When they left to go, where they went, when the kings of the Philistines realized Akish brought David, whom they knew killed their champion Goliath, they said to Akish, no, we cannot go to the battlefield against Israel with this man. When we are in the battle, he's going to turn against us so that he can sell himself well to, for reconciliation with his king. So the result of that, they told him that, tell this man to go back. The Bible says, he went back with his men, 400 men. When they were coming down and they looked upon Ziggler, they saw it on fire. They see the smoke coming out. When they got there, everything is destroyed. Their wives and children have been taken into captivity. You know, and there's no, there's no sign of blood there because they, were, they didn't kill them. You see, look how Amalek came. Because it was Amalek that attacked Ziggler. And he, he came to attack and found the women and the children. If you want to know which spirit is it that's, you know, using nations where you find there is wars and, and women and children are suffering in those, in those wars. It's the spirit of Amalek. You see, it's the spirit of Amalek. The people of Amalek have disappeared and I'll show you how God achieved that. So, you can see that that spirit only targets the weak, the weaker ones. The weaker ones. It be our children. It be our women. It be a weaker uh, uh, those that are weak because they are tired, they are fatigued, even if they are men. And that's what that spirit goes after, to destroy the weaker ones. And, but we know that God gave mandate to Saul to destroy them, to finish them off. And that's the test Saul failed. And I want you to understand, from the time of Moses, that assignment was 
a national assignment. The assignment to destroy Amalek was a national assignment. But in the day of Saul, God made that a family assignment because he took Saul, which is of Benjamin, and he said to him, you go and finish Amalek because I promise that I will have war with them generation after generation until I wipe them off. Now, that assignment then took that national battle into a lot more family battle. Yes, Saul is going to go with the rest of Israel. But understand, because he is leading that battle, you know, it means that the Amalekites will single out the family of Benjamin to destroy it. And that's where this became a very personal family battle. This will help you understand because Mordecai comes from the family of Benjamin. And it will be of interest to you that even Apostle Paul, he comes from that family of Benjamin. He has had to deal with that. Glory to God. But anyway, you know, we see how this assignment, Saul failed it because this instruction was so clear. I want you to hear. This is one of those verses in the Bible that you think of God as being cruel because when he gives instruction, he says, go and destroy the whole city. The animals don't keep. The men, the women, the children, everything goes. The moment God gives such instruction, you must know that you are dealing with something deep. I will repeat that again. There are instructions in which God gives for the destruction of the entire, you know, family lineage, like what he gave. When he does that, and it's not all the time, saints, when he does that, you are dealing with a lot deeper problem than you think. Now, if you were to understand this, it will take you back to Esau. Why God will say, when the child is still in his mother's womb, Esau have I hated or not preferred, but I prefer Jacob. Which tells you, therefore, that in all these entrances of children and babies coming in this world, there are some that are a result of demonic manipulation and demonic engineering, if I can use that term. And those are wicked people that no matter what, they don't change. They make up that group called the Sons of Belial. Belial being the name of Satan, another form of Satan in manifestation. You see, they, they are called the Sons of Belial because he contributed to their coming into being. Be that as it may, this is one of the reasons you will hear God say in the Bible, you go and destroy the whole. Now, what has changed in the New Testament is the fact that there is what is called deliverance. Deliverance is where a person comes forth and say, I want to be free from what oppresses me and uses me to do this. So that deliverance is when there is separation. That's one. But then there is what is called disarming. Disarm. Disarm is not the same as deliverance. Because 
in the case of disarming, the person being disarmed does not want to give up what they are carrying, you see. But you are removing what they are carrying so that they do not perpetuate evil. There is such. And you need to know that as a saint, as a child of God, in the light of what we are going to learn more about, that you can disarm darkness in your family, in your community. Not that people are delivered, but that darkness will not operate when you are there. It will not operate within your territory and jurisdiction. It will be according to your what you declare and say. I hope you understand that. But if any individual wants that spirit to use them, you know, it can use them, but outside your territory. I hope you understand that. The moment they enter your territory, you arrest that spirit. That's what Matthew 18 is referring to when you are dealing with difficult people that don't want reconciliation, they don't want restoration, they want life to be difficult, uh, they don't want to humble themselves, and as a result of that, they go out, even if you follow all the different protocols for restoration, you know. And what God says is, uh, you can bind the spirit that they are using. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And you can agree as touching some of their activities, that those activities will not prosper in your territory, in your life. The Bible says it shall be so. And it's referring to rebellious, stubborn people that even if different ways to gain them, to reconcile them, has been uh, initiated and followed, but they don't want to follow that route. They prefer uh, to go out on their own and maybe even use some of the things they knew about you to use it against your life. And the Spirit of God says you can bind the spirits that use them. You can arrest the spirits that use them. You can frustrate the spirits that use them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, they are mine in the midst. You have to understand the context there that it's referring to dealing with difficult people, rebellious people, and you now have to agree with the remaining obedient ones that are in agreement that the activities of that wicked spirit that's using brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, who has declared themselves the enemy of Christ, the enemy of the church, that spirit will not succeed. Sooner or later, whether they are on a platform, uh, you know, like uh, Facebook, whatever platform they are using to terrorize the church, the men and the women of God, sooner or later you will see them exposed. Very soon, their weakness will come out. And that's exactly what's playing out this day. You go and follow those that call themselves um, attackers of men and women of God, say, you know, going after true servants of God for whatever reason. Maybe they are offended and they're trying to do their own thing to try to win followers to themselves from that man or that woman of God. Sooner or later, you will see that man will be exposed. You know, he will be exposed very well because their activity can be arrested according to Matthew 18. So you then need to understand how that works out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So when we are talking about these ancient battles, you need to understand that it's coming from so far from the time when there was no deliverance. That's why in the Old Testament, God will say, you go and destroy the whole city, you destroy the whole uh, family and so forth. But in today, if, if you had such, you know, you have such uh, uh, families, communities, very simple, my brother and sister, because we are under a new covenant established about, upon better promises, you know, better conditions. We have the name of Jesus, which name has authority in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. 
And that name, when it's exercised, it casts out demons. And that could be in the deliverance for those that are willing among such groups. Which means among the Amalekites, you will have found people that are innocent. But because what is in them uh, cannot be separated at that time, they needed to be destroyed. It cannot come out of them, it's part of them. You know, demonic manifestation and how to deal with those, it was the knowledge that came with Jesus Christ. Before then, you know, we only find David playing music. Every time he played music, change the atmosphere and charge the atmosphere with different ways of thinking and and a soul will think in a particular way. When David leaves the environment, a soul will go and get uh, uh, those old thoughts. When he gets them, they attract back that that evil spirit. And the evil spirit will oppress him and, and, and make him behave like a madman during that time. When, when David comes, he plays music, that spirit will go because it used to latch on wrong thinking. That, that spirit that troubled Saul, it used to come on wrong thinking. And the wrong thinking was initiated when the same spirit influenced the women to sing a song that was provocative. They thought they meant well, but they were doing nobody good because the song elevated David, provoked Saul, and Saul, in provocation, persecuted David, which means that song didn't do David well. Where was it coming from? The song was coming from that evil spirit. It's possible one of those women was sleeping and they dreamt it. They didn't even have discernment to know where this dream is coming from. During the day, they start singing. David has killed his 10,000. Saul, his 1,000. Others will even say, oh, Saul didn't even achieve a 1,000. He, he killed his 100. He killed his 50. And when Saul thought about those words, because those words were coming from an evil spirit, when he thought about those words, they, that evil spirit oppressed his mind. It oppressed him. Then when David used to play music, the music he was playing involved words. He was not just playing music, he was speaking words. And when he was singing and speaking words, when Saul hears those words, and start thinking on them, the evil spirit that was oppressing his mind, it left the mind. That's how deliverance was done in the Old Testament, through music. And there's a lot to learn there because it means that in our day and age, we can deliver a lot of people who are oppressed in their mind if we sing songs, for an example, that get them into thinking in line with the Word of God. As they are thinking in line with the Word of God, whatever was holding on to their mind and oppressing them, maybe even bringing suicidal thoughts, that those things can leave them and, and be lifted off. You know. And obviously, when they leave that kind of environment, they will need to maintain that by continuing to think right. You know, That's a good way to understand how deliverance was done in the Old Testament. But then, in the New, you can disarm, you can, uh, you can do deliverance on people who want to be free, but you can disarm those who don't want to be free. You can bind what there is using them. You can arrest what is using them. And within your territory, it will not operate. And that is the good news about deliverance now. But in the Old Testament, understand, when God gives instruction, He says, go and destroy the whole family, the whole city. Because what is in them cannot be separated from them. So destroy it and get rid of it. That's how they used to get rid of it. Can I hear you shout amen if you are still following me? Glory to God. Amen. 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 Thank you. Now you can mute your device. Much appreciated. Thank you. You can mute your device. So, we are defining for you this ancient battle that Mordecai and Esther are finding themselves in. If you do not know the nature of the battle you are fighting, how will you know how to respond? 
Because the Bible says, this kind goes not out except through fasting and prayer. This kind. Which means, how did Esther know what kind of fasting to embark on? Because she knew the kind of the battle she was fighting. There are family battles that were entered in by our forefathers and they resurface sometimes. They resurface sometimes. And when they do, it can be a problem for the younger generation. And I'm telling you, there are families that also suffer the attack of being recipients of generational blessings. There are people who don't know that there is such things as generational blessings where you live your life and things just work for you. Because in your lineage, you had a man or a woman who was a prayer warrior or a giving warrior. If they prayed, they prayed their generations out of trouble. If they gave, they gave their generations out of trouble. Not just to the second generation. You find very far. And now we know that from the scriptures, if people are recipients of generational blessings, they're going to have to stay in the same line to maintain it. Otherwise, they will receive attacks that they cannot explain. When the Shunammite woman who built a room for Elisha received a male child, after some time, and this is after years, my brother and sister, that boy was attacked by headache. He is suffering the counterattack of this blessing that God gave to, to his mother and father in the form of himself. And he was attacked. And if you really look carefully, he, he had become of age to be able to go to the field. This young man is probably in his teenage years. He's probably 14, 15, 16. He was able to go to the field. Which means the enemy took so many years to come and remind him what? As long as I see you, I see the result of generational blessing. And I want to stop it because your life is a testimony itself. And he attacked it. Fortunately, the woman knew and understood the nature of that attack. That's why she went looking for that man of God that God had used to bring about this miracle. Fortunately, he was still alive. And that's why she will not settle for Gehazi. She didn't want to settle for Gehazi. She wanted the man himself, Elisha. And indeed, he brought back that young man from the dead. Glory to God. And how grateful we are for that. Amen. So, you can understand, there are others in their families, in their lives. The difficulties you experience is because you are a recipient of generational blessings. Things happen for you. But at the same time, you suffer losses that you cannot explain. You can't put your finger on it. Where is this coming from? And this is what's happening here in the book of Esther between chapter 1 and chapter 3. They are dealing with an ancient battle that's been there from the womb has surfaced in the day of Moses, again in the day of David, 
in the day of Saul and sort of disappeared and show itself in a foreign country in the form of Haman, the Agagite. This man, he knows why he hates the Jewish people and Mordecai and Esther. And because Mordecai knew about this battle before it surfaced, he told Esther, don't reveal where you come from and your people. Why will he give her that advice when she's going for the contest up until that time? You know, you don't have a man called Haman. As far as Bible record is concerned, you don't have Haman in chapter 1, you don't have Haman in chapter 2. You're going to get him in chapter 3. But it's in chapter 2 that Mordecai told Esther, don't expose your family. Why? Because we are of the family of Benjamin and there's a man here he's going to come after us but he's also going to go ahead and go after the whole nation and in the mind of Satan he's going to use this hammer to stop the restoration of the nation of Israel back to the land. Number two, he's going to stop by destroying them. The coming of the Messiah. Jesus Christ, as we know him, owes his existence to Esther and Mordecai because they preserved their nation. And he was as the seed of David, he was in there. So you can understand that this role that Esther and Mordecai are going to play is a critical role. It's an important role. And God is going to use them to preserve the nation and the Messiah. And you might as well add is going to preserve you and me. Which means when we read this story, we are seeing how God used Esther and Mordecai to save the Jews, to save Jesus, and to save you and me. That's how you have to think about it. If the Jews were not saved, Jesus would not have come. Jesus didn't come. You and I will not have been partakers of the blessing of Abraham, will not be saved today. So we owe our existence to the survival of Noah, yes, but also the survival of Esther and Mordecai now. And that's where we are at. So at this point, I want us to pray. I want us to pray. You're going to pray with me and where you are, if you can unmute it will be good. If you can unmute, it's all right. At least a certain percentage of unmuted, we can be able to sustain the network as well. But we do want some people who can unmute, please. Especially those that are watching also as groups, we want to hear your voices as you pray. And, you know, watch out for me. When I do this, I say in Jesus' name we pray. I want you to say amen and then mute your device so I can carry on. Okay. Can I hear you shout amen if you can hear me? Glory to God. Amen. amen. Glory. Amen. Amen. Glory. Amen. So, our prayer point now 
It's a prayer that we call upon God Almighty to bring to light, to bring to focus every hidden source of the battle you encounter now. Some of your battles, it's because of the names that you are carrying, which have given the enemy access to oppress. If it's the name that should be changed, so be it. But it's a prayer that says, Lord, bring to light. the form, the nature, the source of the battle in my life. Some battles are in relationships. Bring to light. Let it not remain hidden. That this Haman, the Agagite I'm dealing with, is the descendant of that Agag, which Saul should have finished and yet he didn't. And it took Samuel to finish him off. <clears throat> but his descendants survived. They ran away. Bring to focus the nature, the source of the battle I'm in. In the name of Jesus three times. If you can unmute in the name of Jesus three times and we begin to pray, you can also pray in the spirit. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father God, we thank you today. As we pray, we saints, we thank you for the light of God that you have given to us today. Thank you, Father God, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That in this day and age, Father God, the battles that we find ourselves in, in our families, in our communities, Business. All such battles that have sources, that have forms and shape. And Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we call upon the name of the Lord, as we call upon the fire of the Holy Ghost, we pray that your power will bring to focus the nature of these battles, the source of these battles. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Pariana de Lelico Sorino de la Cantere de la Carlos Tata, Le Panda de Gando Socomande de Gandasso, Era Bayando Rubo Secanda la Lavagato de Bacasheco, Creama Fondoso Pro Bailando Costiama, Mamma Yamando Rubo Serdia Bacasso Toprochini, Rabala Que Sondoro Fabra Mandaria de Bosso Tacaya, De Bahanda Rabala Cosete de Bacrado. Bring to light, bring to focus, Father God, the source of every battle. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, every hidden thing of darkness, bring to light, expose with your fire. Barima ande kashando kosatala, mareka yando robo kosele di gaya bala kosatala, marele bakando robo kosetele di bayando robo bakasiya. Riba kanda rana baka sete ne ba kushata, rosha dere kale bala kusuto kole, arande ne baka yando rufa baka sala yo kusuna kaya, kroshe ya la kama kusunda yika, arande ne deka mwa tondo roba ya dere kusi ya bala kusoni, kroshe kanda ne kalo fa kamra maso ne kroshe, riba kanda la ba kona riba kanda riba kusite, la tabaroni ya talamra katoro dige brika shoda yaka. 
Set your fire for the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ and expose every deeds of the wicked ones. Every ancient battle. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. Please make sure your devices are muted. You know, as we are praying, the Lord is helping someone. Please mute your device. The Lord is helping someone. There is hatred and misunderstanding you cannot explain. The devil even hates you through people. You do not and you cannot explain it. You try to be nice. But listen. The Lord will reveal to you where this is coming from. So you can begin to live above that rejection. Because you have also started to doubt yourself because of the hatred that you cannot explain where it comes from. It's not because of how you look. It's not because of what you don't have. It's stemming from an ancient battle that has surfaced now and the hatred has been directed towards you. But the light of God is coming to you so you know where is this coming from and you will know how to respond. Not only is that light coming, but it's coming with wisdom. To know how to respond and you live above hatred because or and rejection because this it wastes your time 
it's wasting your time. You are not productive because of so much suffering due to rejection and the hatred that you cannot explain. But it's because its stem and roots, it's on the ancient, ancient battle. So the Lord is helping you as we are praying. That's just a sample. And the Lord has heard our prayer. He hears our prayers. He brings to light an understanding concerning the source, the shape, the form of ancient battles that are contributing to your battles now. Once you see the link, you should know what to do. Glory to God. Now, I am going to introduce the second part. And the Lord will help us to build upon it. And I trust God that we are at the level when God can start to to give us this knowledge. I want you to open in the book of Esther. Look at chapter 2. Esther chapter 2. I want you to look at verse 17 and we are going to look at verse 21. And the king loved Esther above all the women and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Made Esther queen instead of Vashti. Mark that down. Verse 21. And in those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, you need to put down that he was sitting in the king's gate. There are many gates leading into the palace. There are gates that they use to bring the livestock for slaughter. But there's a gate you will not find livestock waste because it doesn't use that. It's not an ordinary gate. It's not a common gate. It's the king's gate. And the knowledge of ancient gated communities will help you a lot. I want to bring that understanding to you because this level of teaching will require that you develop a mentality and understanding of thrones and gates. And gates in the sense of ancient setup where you will have a city surrounded by walls, but in those walls are gates leading into the city. Associated with those gates are towers where there is a watchman who can see far in different directions. And the gates are closed in the evening. Except for the eye of a needle. Where Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go 
through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And you and I, we think about the eye of a needle as in, uh, you know, the needle that we use to sew our clothes. Far from truth, my brother and sister. We know very well that even your finger cannot go through uh, that needle. How can even a camel go through that needle? Jesus was referring to the man's gate. So you will have this big gate associated with these walled cities. And then once they are closed, any big stuff will not be able to go through. But you have got a man's gate where you can still allow people to come in. Chariots, they are shut out. Big supplies are shut out. But you may have an individual who is still in the field and they are walking in. Because it takes a lot of effort to close these gates. That individual will go through that. A man's gate. Man's door, if you will. It might be right on the door, on the gate itself. Or on the side of that gate. So to come with a camel with his hunchback. And the gates are already closed. Jesus said it's easier for that camel to go through that eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Telling you the difficulty in the way of, uh, you know, for a camel to go through that eye of a needle, a man's gate, a man's door, it takes some adjustment. Its hunch must be adjusted. Everything, it has to kneel down humble itself, maybe even crawl, it's not comfortable, it crawls, then it enters. It crawls, then it enters. Glory to God. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, are you still there? Okay. So you know that camel will need to adjust to go through that man's door to enter the city. And that's exactly what Jesus is referring to. There's no rich man, rich woman, rich kid who can enter the kingdom of God without adjustment that involves humbling yourself. It's not possible. Just like that camel, you have to humble yourself, kneel down and go through. Anyway, that's not the main teaching, but what I'm trying to get to you is to understand that there's a king's gate, which is where Mordecai is located. And Mordecai knows that's where the king, the nobles, the princes, they pass through that gate. They go through that gate. Now, <clears throat> I'm glad that you read this book to know that what started as a feast ended in tears. You know, in today's term, you will hear people use such words as it shall end in tears. It ended in tears. This feast, this party ended in tears. 127 provinces represented in the special gathering where the king is showing off and the queen is there and when he is he's drunk he calls for her she doesn't come and 
and it leads to demotion for her, removal, and it leaves a vacant throne. I'm just going to introduce this to you and going into tomorrow we'll build upon it so you can understand how it applies to you at your personal level, family level. In this fasting of Esther, I believe God wants to bring to our consciousness so we can possess vacant thrones and unmanned gates. Vacant thrones and unmanned gates. Vacant thrones. I want you to turn to Colossians. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 16 only. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. So it tells us all things were created by him. He says the things that are in heaven and that are in earth. Then he tells us their nature, the nature of those things. It says visible and invisible. Where? In heaven and on earth. Which means if you go to heaven, there will be things that are visible and there will also be things that are invisible, even if you are in heaven. It doesn't mean in heaven when you get there, everything will be visible there when you get there when jesus said in my father's house are many mansions are many realms are many planes of existence it means there is visible and invisible things even when you get there okay and then on earth there are visible and invisible things that's what this verse is saying in heaven, there are visible and invisible things. On earth, there are visible and invisible things. Then he says, whether they be thrones, I want to only focus on that one, thrones. Aha. Uh -huh. So this verse, before we go to dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. Here, this verse is revealing to us that there are thrones that are visible and invisible in the realms of heaven and in the realms of the earth. There are thrones that are visible. If we talk here on earth, there are thrones associated with monarchs chiefs, kings. Those are visible ones. We can relate to them. And in the story of Esther, the throne of Vashti, it's a visible throne and it's left vacant. And there is a process to fill the vacancy of that throne and that's a visible one but the bible says even here on earth there are invisible thrones 
And just as it happens in the natural, these thrones may also be vacant. And I'm here because God wants to fill the vacancies of both natural, visible, and spiritual, invisible thrones, which were created by Christ and for Christ. These are not evil thrones. They are evil thrones. That's not what I'm talking about for now. I'm talking about the thrones created by Christ and for Christ, visible and invisible. Some are vacant because the one who was sitting on them has departed because he finished his job, is dead. And God is seeking for one to take that throne. And the throne can be at the national level, local level, family level. You will understand what it means when the Bible says Jesus or God has made us kings and priests. Is it for the future or for now? I'm here to submit to you, my brother and sister. We are kings now for the thrones that are invisible. Now, here on earth, made by Christ and for Christ. And then, you are a priest for altars now, both visible and invisible, here on earth. And from that throne, you rule, you reign, and things are done according to your words. And there are many vacant thrones at family level, national level, even internationally. And God is seeking for candidates to ascend the throne and save a family and save a nation. You can occupy a throne in the spirit and people may not even know that you are a king in the natural. I told you, priesthood had two orders. The first order is the order of Aaron. To occupy that, you have to be a Levite through the family of Kohath because Levi had Gershom, Kohath and Mirari. To be a priest, a high priest, you have to come through Kohath, through Amram, through Aaron. And in Aaron, it's Nadab and then Abihu who died, no children. Living Ithama and Eliaza. So you can only come and be a high priest through Ithama. This is Abiatha in the day of David. Or through Eliaza. It's Zadok in the day of David. David had two priests in his time. He passed them on to Solomon. They came from the two lineage of the surviving descendants of Aaron, Ithama and Eleazar. Those are the only priests that you can get in the order of Aaron, all the way to Zechariah and John the Baptist. But friends, Jesus is called the high priest. And according to the order of Aaron, Jesus doesn't qualify to be called a priest. Therefore, 
he has to be a high priest after a different order and is the order of Melchi Zedek which is a higher order than the order of Aaron or that of Levi Christ was a priest and is a priest in the order of Melchizedek is the higher order you may not be a king in the order of earthly princes royal families but in the order of Christ you are a king and there are thrones to be possessed and ascend to There are certain things that should be happening in your family and they are not because that throne in that family has been vacated. Maybe there was a very strong Christian in your house. He took his position and that throne, it ruled and they vacated it sometimes because People decide not to walk with God. And the stuff that started to enter into the house. You will understand when we go also to unmanned gates. When we look at the gates, there is gates, king's gate, and there is a throne. There are people who have left their thrones, others have left their gates. Whatever that gate is, is it at a community level, family level, national level, district level? And since they have left those gates unmanned, those thrones unmanned or unoccupied, things have started to happen. 2022, you and I are being invited through this teaching, through this revelation, we are being invited to take and occupy vacant thrones, some of which were left by those who have departed to be with the Lord. And the Lord has been looking for a man or a woman worthy to occupy that throne. Some of which have been left vacant because like Esau, others have valued the things of this world more than the things of God. So they value other things and they live that throne vacant and that throne was created by Christ and for Christ there are men and women I am calling you back to occupy your gate to occupy the throne you know when you are in your seat of authority, you know there is nothing that will happen in your surrounding, in your family, among your loved ones, that you will not know about it, that you cannot do anything about it. This fasting for us, it's an invitation to occupy vacancies. A vacancy, it's a position that has not been filled and it needs to be filled. There are losses that are necessary. This is why 
In Ezekiel 22 verse 30, God speaks about looking for a man to stand in the gap. He's talking about a man, a woman, who will ascend and take on a throne so they can stop Haman from destroying the whole family, the whole territory, the whole nation. There are gates that have been left and the stuff coming through those gates is dangerous. And there has to be a Mordecai who will sit at that gate. So they control what comes in, what goes out. A careful student of the word will know this very well. That there are gates in two territories, visible and invisible. Jesus Christ, in Matthew 16, he speaks about, you are Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Hell has got gates. There are gates leading into underground chambers. There are tunnels that protrude out of the earth in different regions of the earth that are used as entrances into the underground chambers where there are gates leading up to those chambers. But there are also gates. There are portals, if you remember. There are gates. Jacob calls it, this is the house of God, the gate of heaven. He located that gate. There are gates leading to heaven. There are gates leading to earth and to nations, visible and invisible. The call here, it's not a natural call for you to go and occupy the Namibian gate. Namibian border, Namibian gate. Well, if the Lord lead you there, praise the Lord. But hey, there's a gate leading into your family. And if it's unmanned, and God says, I looked for a man, a woman. I looked for one person in that family to mend that gate or to occupy the throne and I found none. What's going to happen? Destruction is coming in. You can't all be crazy in the family. You might as well take the title of the boring one because you want to save everybody. You may not be considered cool because one who occupies the throne has to be sober. Glory to God. One who occupies the gate has to be sober. Be sober. Be vigilant. For your adversary the devil walks about seeking whom we may devour. Whom resist steadfast. Speaking with the enemies at the gate. The story of Esther it's a story of ascending into a vacant throne which you use to rescue families, communities, nations. Some of you, you have been given, although you didn't understand it, access into certain nations' gates. 
And that's why you are able to see into those nations. You have seen yourself by the Spirit of God visiting those nations. Sometimes taking care of the poor there. God is telling you, I was looking for a man, for a woman, concerning this nation, in this particular area. Some of those nations is the healing. Some of the nations is because they don't know God. And God has found a man or a woman in you to stand in the gap for those nations. It's communities, it's families. There are gates, there are thrones. And I want to leave it there, at that introduction level. And we can build upon this, and you and I are going to take our rightful place. When you have that in your mind, that you occupy a throne, you will start to act like a king, where you issue out decrees and things will happen according to your command in your territory. For Christ's sake, glory to God, bringing glory to him for whom that throne was made, by whom that throne was made. There are gatekeepers. There are men and women that have discovered gates, thrones, and some of those are vacant. And it's always good to call you first at the smallest level, which is a family unit. So if there are gates, there are thrones in your family, that are not occupied because either somebody has died or somebody has left the faith or somebody has been attracted away because of the desires of this world and they have left their assignment God is calling you to take over There is such things in the kingdom of God as promotion because God has found men and women that are available and they are willing and he gives them a throne, he gives them a gate. He says, I allocate this to you. It's not about being famous, my brother and sister. It's about being effective. I would rather be effective than famous. I want results. You can have results. You can stop certain things that you consider normal in your life, in your family, in your community. You can start to release development. You can start to speak in your territory and be shocked what happens in line with your speech. This fasting, it's an invitation to ascend thrones to main gates. And the Lord God Almighty he gives you understanding. The Spirit of God gives you understanding of this message. And we'll break it down further. We shall meet again tomorrow. Same place, same time. Half past 6 p.m. Right here. Same link that you used to join tonight. You're going to use the same link tomorrow. And we are going deeper. By Friday, 
when we come together in one building, glory to God. We are taking our seats. And things are going to happen. We'll open our lips with understanding. We'll open our lips with clarity. And know that indeed Christ has made us kings. And there are thrones that are invisible on earth to be occupied by you, by me, at different levels of existence. Can I hear you shout, Amen, glory to God, hallelujah. Yes, yes, there are gates. There are gates to technology. There are gates to health solutions. My brother and sister, there are gates. <laughs> there are gates. When you break this down, you will understand it's so practical. Some of the people that you may have looked up to, you may just have found a man or a woman who are faithful at their gate. Where a man says, I would rather be a doorkeeper than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. It's a man who has found his door. And that's something else. You have thrones, you have gates, and you have doors. Find somebody who has found his door and is faithful there. And they will rather stay there than to be attracted away by anything else. My prayer for you is that you will locate your throne, you will locate your gate, you will locate your door. If it's not clear, it will be clear in the name of Jesus. That's my prayer for you, my brother and sister. That any vacant throne left by any Vashti, you will occupy. You will occupy. You will occupy. We don't just read these ancient stories just to stay there with the historical understanding. No, my brother and sister, we are reading this for us. It's not written to us. It's written to those people, but it is written for us. It's about those people, but for us. For us to understand in this day, in 2022, in your community, in your family, in that family where the enemy has been stealing from, how is he getting into there to steal? There are some gates that have not been made. There are some doors that are left open. And everyone is focused on their own thing. And God is saying, I just am looking for one man, one woman, one teenager who will say, Lord, I'll stand at the gate. Glory to God. I'll rather be a doorkeeper. I'll rather be a gatekeeper. I'll rather be a throne keeper than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And there and there and there, God is going to use you to save lives and to put things in order. Glory to God. To put things in order and get results. Glory to God. Let me pray for you. Our Father, we are so grateful tonight. Thank you for the word. Thank you for your spirit. And thank you for the benefits of the fast that we have, that we see. And thank you for giving to us the knowledge by which, by which we are saying vacant
thrones and main gates and doors in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for enlightening of your people that the eyes of their understanding will be flooded with light in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sustain them as they continue to fast, breaking down the reward of the fast to their level and their age. Thank you for what you have started to do as this mighty army and forces of light have embarked on this fast. Thank you for revelations. Thank you for visitations. Thank you for the touch of the Spirit of God. And thank you for exposures of hidden things that are ancient in nature and have been affecting there today in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your angels that are dispatched concerning the affairs of your people. Thank you for the Spirit of God, our teacher and our guide. Lord, I also thank you for our youth that have embarked on this. Let them realize the benefit so they will not depart from this way. In the name of our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.